<clears throat> Greetings, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. The temptation of talking about Andrew Tate has only come because um, I'm not seeing people talk openly in the way that they should be about Romania, about its reputation, and about essentially who owns Romania. And I've been trying to populate it to some of these uh, regular channels that keep tweeting out, uh, keep sending out and creating information, creating content. Let me see if I can get some live streaming. Uh, the lighting is very bad. Let's see if I can get that light up my way here. As you can see, there's no professionalism here. This is a podcast tweeted in the most basic way. Right, now, I'm an anti-Zionist, and I've been outspoken about um, being an anti-Zionist for the last decade. I've also been cancelled by a British MP. Many of you will know um, about my case, the people who follow my uh, presidential case, quoted as such by a Lebanese diplomat or official in the Lebanese embassy, his name is Ali Barnout. So I'm just going to bring some clarity to what, what is actually happening here in, from my point of view about the Andrew Tate brothers. And I understand that I'm, not, I'm already shadow banned anyway, but I understand that um, there's been a lack of information that's not being populated. And there are certain people who uh, bring out the information on, uh, for example, about Andrew Tate. And you've got, I'm going to name a few of them here that I follow. Fresh and Fit on YouTube. As you know, YouTube isn't the best of places to talk freely. Um, also, Stefan Loridan, um, who's just released uh, an update on Andrew Tate, the ca case, excuse me. Um, there are several people who, who uh, also talk about this, including uh, TK Talks, TK the uh, Tam Khan. He's just released one about... Um, Tate case ex expert exposes D Dilcott, um, and I haven't gone through it yet, so I've just started off on it. Um, but I will be giving a bit of um, my side of how I see what's been happening here lately with the Andrew Tate case. It's a uh, it's very important. This case is more important than the Julian Assange case. We already know um, Julian Assange is, in my point of view, he's not the best example of the um, what they're trying to do and to, trying to set a precedence on this case to put him inside like they're doing with the Tate brothers. Um, I've never in my lifetime come across two revolutionary men who have been out as outspoken as they have been but they've been given platform and that, and this is um something that that needs to be micromanaged the fact that they have been given platform for a considerable amount of time we must understand that there are certain um, press media releases out there that have a sole aim, and that is to blanket the news, the real, the, the real news, the priority news that should be given out, that should be spread out to the masses. Um, and I fear that they're using the Tate brothers as a cover on one aspect of it, we have the monarchy Prince Andrew case currently going. I'm actually using the lawyers 
or I've been using the lawyers that Andrew Tate used to rep to, to represent him. And they're called Blackfords, and I'm going to talk about them in, in, in further detail because my ex used to work uh, works there. Um, and that's not why I'm going to talk about them. I, 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 I don't have any communication with her. But what I'm going to do is expose Blackford's lawyers in the next podcast about my presidential case. At the moment, I've got a couple of police officers who, um, who are taking me to court for an alleged... Who are, they're calling themselves key workers. And they're taking me... I can't talk too much about it because it's still... Um, hasn't reached trial yet, and it's my intention that the cases should be dropped. And I'm, I'm, I'm coming on uh, YouTube here to talk about it. It's because I can't afford a two hundred pound an hour solicitor, and I don't think most of the people watching this can either. But why I'm not confident of is the British judicial system here in England, um, and. I will amplify that that discussion in another YouTube about Blackford's lawyers who are the people who represented Prince Andrew. And the reason why I'll be talking about them is because they were currently representing me until very recently. They dropped one of my cases. Uh, they dropped my two cases 72 hours before uh, they, were, they were due a court with me. Now... The Tate brothers, yeah. First of all, I, I've been trying to populate a video which um, will shed light on Romania in a significant way. Let me see if I can bring that up. Um, we are buying up Manhattan, Hungary. Romania. Okay, here we go. The Israeli president, former yes, president, I'm going to let you hear the sound on this uh, because I can't, I can't, I don't know whether I'm, go, I'm crossing um, rights, um, copyrights here, but I'm going to let you hear it. It's in, it's in, it's in Hebrew, but I will go through it with you in English briefly. And you, I'll, uh, I'll put a little description in the link, not now after this podcast. I'll put a little description. Let me see if I can do it right now while we're here. And they say there's no time like the present. Um, no, I won't be able to do it right now. I'll put it in the chat. There you go. It's in, it's in the chat line there. Check that out. And spread it out because us anti-Zionists, as a British Lebanese here living in London since 1973, I'm as old school as you can possibly get. I went to the school that Pink Floyd sang the wall. Do you know that song? We don't need no education. Um, I uh, The prefix, the people who sang that song, the kids who sang that song on the album were my prefix in my school so that's that's I'm, I'm about as old school as you can get that's not the only reason i'm also a school classmate to king robbo most of you will know king robbo as the man that was involved with the graffiti wars with banksy banksy became famous off of the head of king robbo my school classmate his name is john robertson he passed away and he died in a mysterious accident I urge you to check the Channel 4 documentary, Graffiti Wars. Check that out. It's an award-winning one, and it's very worthy of watching. I will also be talking about that hardcore in um, Rumble. But uh, I need to uh, check me out on Rumble. I haven't, I haven't opened it yet. It's called British Lebanese. Um, I haven't uh, released much on that yet. So, but I will do because I can't talk here. The, 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 my um, my web my website here um, has received a strike on it. I've never really done much on it, and that strike was because I re-released a YouTube uh, a news 
um, broadcast of Al Quds firing a rocket onto Israel because I've done that. They've demonetized me and they've, they've, uh, they're not bringing it back for, for some reason. Um, so here we go with the uh, Israeli president. Quote, Israeli president, we are buying up Manhattan, Hungary, Romania, Poland. Think about that. This is the president, the former president of Israel saying that. Let's put him on. You can hear it from me here. Right, that's it. Let's repeat that again, and I'll translate it in English. From such a small country like ours, this is... Well, let me go back there a second. Going a bit fast for me. Here we go. From, from, such, from such a small country like ours, ours, this is almost amazing. It's quoted by Shimon Perez. I see that we are buying up Manhattan, Hungary, Romania and Poland. Then he says, and the way I see it, we have no problems. Thanks to our talent, our contacts and our dynamism, we get almost everywhere. Dynamism, that word dynamism, dynamic. The Israelis love to use that, don't they? Dynamic, dynamite, yeah? This is how they function. The mother of terrorism functions with dynamite, with bombs, with terrorism. And indeed, that used to be my profile on my British uh, Lebanese Twitter before it was suspended. Um, <coughs> Israel is the mother of terrorism. Right, let's see <clears throat> what else he says there. Right, that's it. That was it. It's a short 39 second little admission by Israel that they own Romania. How can you be more straightforward? For those out there accusing Andrew Tate and Tristan Tate of um, speaking openly, so openly, yeah, have a look at that. Look at the Israeli president. So this Didcot, whoever they, these people are, these people are um, this organised crime organisation. They brought out a list of pictures of these people, these people, these criminal uh, prosecution and the names of these people. I'll tweet it out my Facebook. I'll put it out my Facebook. These people, in my belief, are affiliated to Mossad agents. You won't really get anybody from the Tate brothers' uh, side tweeting this information out. All the latest YouTubers, Rumble, all the other uh, channels, platforms that are a little bit more relaxed on giving out news um, and don't censor you as much. It's, it's, it's there. Now, why are they not mentioning the fact that Romana Romania is controlled, I've been to Romania, Romania is controlled by the Zionists, the cult, the terrorist cult, Zionism. Why? Why are they not mentioning? I guess for, um, what's his name again? TK, yeah, Tam Khan. Well, he's in Saudi Arabia or is it um, Qatar? So there's no way he's going to be, he's going to openly speak out 
from a personal capacity uh, and, and, and bring forth what I'm bringing forward now. Nobody has mentioned this. I've, I've Googled, I've searched, and I couldn't find anyone exposing Romania as the state that's controlled by Israel. Why? Why? You have to ask yourself, why? Are they being polite? <laughs> or don't they have the balls to just tell it like it is? And I, think, I fear that that's the case. So we need to start to um, hit the core of these individuals in Romania and what they're doing. And it's important that we populate who controls Romania. And this is really why I'm doing this podcast. Yeah, because it's only going to take someone like me to mention it and then hopefully i don't know i don't get uh i'm not on a high um frequency of traffic in social media so i don't i don't have a huge i don't have a huge following um and this is not the reason why i'm here because uh to 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 speak my views on the andrew tate brothers it's here because nobody is hitting the core of the subject and that is the, the fact that israel is conducting everything it's constructing everything that's going on with the tape brothers it's orchestrating everything that's going on they are in full control and shame on you anti-zionists out there shame on you who, who are um uh, bringing out information on the tape brothers and are not speaking out properly like us anti-zionists do in the arab world Certainly, you won't find them on YouTube. I've lost total hope in YouTube. I've done, what, 17 minutes here so far. I wouldn't be surprised if this hasn't gone through or it's not being aired or the audio is messing up on this. But I just wanted to get that out there onto, onto social media so that the people can be tempted to open up even journalists your investigative journalists shame on you i've heard nothing from you about the andrew tate brothers yeah. um, there should be more information about what's going on there isn't and in all honesty as i understand the situation they're not going to release them they are not going to release the tate brothers that's the way i see it uh tommy robinson came out the other day uh, interviewed on um, some podcaster, um, and he 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 also believes that they're not going to release him. He's become too famous, which is sad because uh, we are witnessing what we are witnessing in this, this time is the fact that we are being silenced. Whatever we say, we have been treated like children as adults. And we've been told, you naughty boy, you can't do this, you can't say this, you can't say this, or the police will come around knocking on your door. And they have done on my door on numerous occasions while I'm exposing my presidential case. And let this be a message while I'm here out to certain figures out there, and I'm going to mention them now. Said Hariri, the former Prime Minister of Lebanon. Michel Sleiman, the President of Lebanon. Uh, former president of Lebanon. Uh, Ambassador Rami Mortada, you threatened my mum. I'm going to bring a video out to expose you and your staff and how you can go up and how you can go over a higher ranking of a president who was a president at the time and refute what he re requested when he DM'd me let me repeat that here. The president of Lebanon, former president of Lebanon, Michel Sleiman, DM'd me and got his right hand to phone me. His name was Colonel Adel Mashmushi, who's now General Adel Mashmushi of Lebanon, the general of Lebanon. He's the one who phoned me and spoke to me in several minutes um, in a phone call and told me to go and see the Lebanese embassy and speak to Mr. Sayran. Now, Mr. Sayran 
she called me and she found that the phone that I had on me at the moment I, it only works when I put it on speaker. And she didn't want to talk to me having her on speaker. I wasn't around anyone. It was just me. But she didn't want that. So she put she did put the phone down. I rip, I called her several times. She never got back. So when you when you refute a president's rankings orders handed down from Babda Palace to the embassy in Lebanon, uh, to the embassy here in London, Lebanese embassy, and that the Lebanese embassy don't do nothing. And then Miss Usairan, the ambassador, former ambassador, goes, and then the new one comes in, Rami Mortada, and he does nothing. And I go, I go to the embassy. I was given an open invitation to the embassy by Ali Banut and the former first council, Hazem Abdus Samad. I sat down with the first council. And in case you don't know what first council is in the embassy, first council is someone who is in charge of all the staff in the embassy. I sat down with the first council and with Ali Banut, and they promised to help me in my presidential case. When he left, they replaced him with some new, young, little, inexperienced lady. Her name is Haddad. I can't remember what her name is. She's just a, a pretty face with loads of makeup. One of those people who can't get out of bed without sticking makeup on her face. And she's a circumstantial manager. Circumstantial manager, I've labelled you. And that's what you are, madam. Because you also refuted the president's orders. And for both you and Rami Morta, I have absolutely no respect for you. No respect for you. This is why I've asked you to hand over my case to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And Ali Banut, the official at the embassy, confirmed that he's forwarded it to them. Now, they haven't got back to me. They haven't got back to me. And I've, I've had my mother threatened by the ambassador of Lebanon here in London. They threatened. They tried to get to me through threatening my mum. And I recorded it. And everything that I'm telling you here right now is backed by information. Uh, backed by facts, backed by evidence. I've even recorded the call from the president's office to me. I recorded it. And the Lebanese embassy didn't like it. Uh, maybe that's the why they stopped helping me. I suspect that's the case. But um, I was, I was cancelled by a British Jewish MP, Emily Thornbury. Yeah, Friends of Israel she is, by the way, in case you lot don't know out there. Friends of Israel. This woman whose husband is a judge, an Ashkenazian Jew, and the reason why I say this is because Islington, where I live in, where I have lived in since 1973, um, is one of the top 10 highest Jewish populated areas in, in, in England. And so it's rather interesting that I should be cancelled on all my Twitter accounts, all my platforms on social media for getting out my presidential case. I've been targeted by even Tommy Robinson's mob as well, his electric army. I've been targeted by MP Emily Thornbury's electric army. Yeah, I've micromanaged her hashtag. She's banned me contacting her. And I've even held, I've even tried to hold accountable the former chief superintendent, Inspector Kearney, who was the one who put me in uh, communicado. He got me arrested over a charge, which was a false charge, harassment charge. Who was I allegedly uh, harassing? I was contacting my local councillor in Islington, Islington South. And 
who referred me is impossible that I could have been harassing her. Her name was Ali. Uh, well, it was uh, it was basically uh, asked me to contact the um, Labour constituency here in Islington South, and when I contacted them, no one replied. No one replied to phone calls. No one replied to my emails, and so I outed her on Twitter. And before you know it, um, she finally replies. Why? Because she could see I had a massive following. Every tweet that I used to tweet, it used to hit approximately 380,000 Twitter uh, timelines. From the three accounts that I had, British Lebanese, one word, IT Silver Spoon, which was what the president was following me on, Michel Suleiman. <coughs> Beirut politics, one word. Lebanese tips as well, that Twitter account. They've, been, they've all been shut down. They've silenced me. I got arrested on this false charge of harassment. Um, I outed their counsellor on Twitter. I told them that if you're not going to help me, I'm just going to go back to Boris Johnson. Because Boris Johnson, at the time, lived, lived five minutes away from my house. Five minutes away from, five minute walk, a, a Palestinian stone throw away from my house. And I met him one day coming back from a food bank. It was on my birthday, actually. And it was on the same day as when the Iranians overtook the latest technology of the UAV um, drone. They overtook it, they rebooted it while it was in mid-air and they landed it in, in Iran and they took all the technology and Obama was saying, what was he saying? Oh yeah, he was saying, give us it back, give us it back. Yeah, right. <laughs> and on that day I was coming home and I see Boris Johnson outside his ass. And everybody knows where Boris Johnson used to live. And this is before he uh, uh, dated that other Jewish lady, Carrie. Before, uh, this is while he was dating Carrie, cheating on his wife, who's a judge. And I do believe I've been confronted by her at one occasion in the past. I can't be certain of that, but I, um, I'm of the belief I did. Um, and if she's ever acted uh, before me, um, there, there you go. Now, when I see Boris Johnson, Johnson, I met him, he shook my hands, he wished me a happy birthday, he told me he can't promise, I told him, look, I've got an issue with my MP, Emily Thornberry, and he said to me, he can't promise anything, but he'll, uh, he'll see what he can do, he'll get someone to contact me, and he did, and he was a gentleman with me, despite what everybody thinks about him, he was fine with me, I have no problems with our interactions, and he did put me on to, I think it was Natasha or Natalie, who sent me an email and told me to contact my constituency about it. Now, he's Labour. So I approached, uh, sorry, he's Conservatives. So my MP, Emily Thornbury, is Labour. And Labour's been around here in New Zealand for donkeys. They've even got a Jewish councillor. His name is Martin Clute, who recently I've found he's changed the way he... Uh, his name is written. I think he's added uh, a couple of things there. I don't know how they, they changed their names. And also Alice Perry, the other councillor. Now, I believe she wrote an article about me. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to, I'll come back to uh, when I met Boris Johnson here. So Boris Johnson arranged to get uh, his personal assistant to contact me. She contacted me. She forwarded the details and I contacted them and they never got back. And I went on Twitter and I outed her. And all the journalists were following me because remember, I've spoken in my previous podcast. I was tweeting one day in the city in a local Starbucks, tweeting to Saeed Hariri, the former prime minister, he was doing a questionnaire and he responded to me. And when he responded to me, um, all the journalists started to follow me from all over the world. You name them, 
their chief editors, their um, journalists, their reporters, their commentators, their um, uh, documentary chat shows started following me. CNN, Fox News, BBC, Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera, The Times, The Independent. You name them, they started following my account. And I don't support any political party anywhere in the world. And I'm quite proud of that. Yeah, what should I? Do I look like I've got mug on my forehead? Can you read mug? We're not stupid. We grow up and we come to learn how the politics crumbles here in England. And the way it crumbles here is no different to anywhere else. Maybe Lebanon, Lebanon's politics are more open. Yeah? We're more knowledge in how government functions than your typical white man, dare I say. So, I outed this councillor, Alice Clark Perry. Alice Perry Clark, or Alice Clark Perry, is hyphenated. And recently her name kind of changed in some way or another um, as she was um, a councillor. And I outed her and saying, if you're not going to help me, Boris Johnson told me to contact you. If you're not going to help me, I'm just going to go back to Boris Johnson again. And she sent me a tweet, responded finally, and said, I wouldn't do that if I was you. And I said, watch me. Tweet back, watch me. And I went back, knocked on Boris Johnson's door. It's just up the road from me, very, very close to me. Uh, he's moved now since he got married. And um, she said, uh, yeah, I went back there. I knocked on the door. His Filipino slay, I mean, uh, housework answered. And she uh, called someone and a lady come out to the door, which was Boris Johnson's wife. And I said to her, hello, my name is Sam. I'm the one that the president, Michelle Slayman, follows on Twitter. I've briefed. Boris Johnson about it. Um, he gave me contact details of someone uh, uh, via Natasha or Natalie, he's a PA, to contact. I contacted them. They haven't got back. Yeah. And they're refusing to help me. And so she said she'll pass the message on to Boris Johnson. And that was it. End of story. I come home. I tweeted information out. I CC'd him on the Twitter. And um, 45 minutes later, very loud, violent bang on my front door. Police open up. And I got arrested. And from that day onwards, yeah, I don't have a criminal record to declare here, you see. From that day onwards, I was arrested. I was left incommunicado. Yeah. Um, no lawyer. Denied a lawyer. Friday night, I was arrested. Denied contact with family. Denied contact with the Lebanese embassy. But to have my embassy informed, we're entitled to do that. If we're arrested, you're entitled to have your embassy informed. And I told the police that you can't be just detaining me with no charge. They kept me in Friday. I went on hunger strike from day one. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I told them, look... I I, I must speak to my embassy. They refused. I said to them, I need to speak to my embassy. Tell them I'm the one that the president follows on Twitter and I'm the one that received a phone call from both the former prime minister of Lebanon. Are you listening, Saeed Hadi? Are you listening? Are you listening, Michel Slayman? And the police decided to take that and warp it into, what's this man talking about? He's saying he's received a phone call from the president's office. Well, I have. So what? So what? If you care, if CID cared to look up the direct message from 
the former then president at the time, Michel Sleiman, they would have seen it on my Twitter. But no. They issued Section 2 of the Mental Health Act for the first time in my life. And they sent me to a private mental health hospital. Not to NHS. No, no, no. They sent me to the worst high category mental health prison in England. The worst organisation, mental health organisation called Huntercombe Hospital. And I continued my hunger strike because I could not understand why, A, I was arrested. Why was I arrested? What did I do that was illegal? What did I do that was illegal? They, the, the charge was harassment charge, which was later dropped. Because it could not be possible that I was harassing anyone if Boris Johnson himself has referred me to the people that I was allegedly harassing. So now I've spoke on this podcast, I'm really not sure whether it's, um, I've got a live, whether I've got cut off, I'm almost certain that I probably have. I'm just going to check here while you're online, you might get an echo. Yeah, I'm showing that I'm live. If we get an echo, that means I'm recording. Yeah. Okay, so it's still working live. I believe I haven't intruded into the algorithms yet. So I'm going to continue these conversations on Rumble because I, I, I need to speak openly and freely. I can't be talking like this. Now, I'm a former Hewlett Packard employee. With over 27 years experience in IT, I'm also <clears throat> former transport manager of an IT international IT company. I had a fleet of staff. I was um, running an account for the firm I was working for. Um, and I've been a workaholic all my life. Uh, my last job was been in ING Wholesale Bank. The one before that was in Deloitte and Tooch, famous accountancy firm. Um, and before that, an IT company, before that, Huli Packard, before that, transport manager. Um, and that is my career path uh, in a nutshell. So I've worked all my life. And for me to be subjected to a mental health hospital, I automatically turned into an activist. On hunger strike here, don't forget. I continued my hunger strike in a total of 17 days. They were taking my mail from the, hosp uh, the hospital. Mail from my lawyer was being denied. Repeated requests to send, that, send out my legal paperwork. Nobody's allowed to touch my legal paperwork. Legal paperwork's confidential. So I've had that breached. I continued my hunger strike and all I had in my mouth was water and coffee. 17 days. I was about 85, 86 kilos. I went down to 66 kilos, 67 kilos. Hunger strike. Terrible experience. No one you will speak to. No one, if, if you're a police officer, if you're a lawyer, if you're a barrister, no one you will speak to will tell you in their lifetime, in their career past, very rarely, very rarely, will tell you that I have, I'm a hunger striker, a 17-day hunger striker. I did that. And they continued in, in a mental health hospital not to allow me contact with my family, not to allow me any phone calls. They denied me phone calls with my lawyer. Continued my hunger strike. And the medical professionals in there, I wouldn't put them along the professional line whatsoever. People who have been recruited who have not been sifted through um, properly um, to do the jobs that they were doing, 
who are not qualified to do the jobs they were doing because I've asked them. And they get intimidated when I ask them, where did you qualify? What were your exams? When you ask these mental health professionals who are accusing you of telling lies that you received a phone call from the president's office when I did, and they're refuting it. But they come to learn in the end, and some of them were actually calling me a political victim. So to you, Ali Banut in the Lebanese embassy, yeah? When I use the word political victim, it wasn't me that called myself political victim. It was medical professionals at the hospital that did. Now, later, after I was eventually released, and I had eventually made contact with my family, who never knew that I was detained initially, uh, never knew that I was on hunger strike. Police CID Mark Shi or Mark Shia, had manipulated two of my, my mum and dad were out of the country at the time. So my next of kin weren't available. So my two sisters, who I haven't seen for a, a, a number of years, one of them I haven't seen for 15 years, and the other one I haven't seen for a number of years, um, have been told by CID that I allegedly think that Saeed Hariri is my friend. Couldn't be far from the truth. First of all, why would I want to be a friend of an agent to Zionism. Now you tell me that. I've just tweeted a pic, I've just sent a picture on my Facebook. Check my Facebook. Have a look below. You get a link to my Facebook. Syrian girl follows me on my Facebook. Yeah. I've been interviewed by Morris Herman, the only independent investigative journalist I allowed to interview me. This is before my hunger strike. Um, he passed away recently, uh, a few years ago, on mysterious circumstances as well. He went out, he couldn't handle it anymore in England. He was giving out information that was truth. He was telling you what was going to happen with all, all the, um, all the, uh, the, this pandemic, alleged pandemic. And so I need to speak openly, but I'm reluctant to because of the fact that I'm on YouTube now. So I've done 43 minutes right now. So I've kind of touched into my case now. Now I'm going to continue this over on, on Rumble. Um, go find the funds to uh, feed Rumble because you can't go live without paying them. And I'm unemployed now. I've had my career shattered. I can't apply for a job in IT now without... Here in England, we, we have to provide a criminal record. And I didn't have a criminal record to declare before my eviction. And all this that I'm telling you revolves around my illegal eviction. My MP knew I was King Robbo's school classmate. When I went through this illegal eviction, which they were found guilty, Islington Council were found guilty, therefore they were forced to have replaced me, uh, rehouse me. There's so much I've got to tell you. It's um, it's a it's not a short story, and it's not something that I will be able to professionally uh, create here on YouTube. Um, and I'm doing it the way I uh, only know. So I'm gonna slow down here, and I'm gonna kind of round it off. Coming back to the Tate brothers issue, it's important that they get released. They're not going to be released, and the lady who's come over from America, who calls herself some kind of lawyer, yeah? She is the equivalent to Dorothy Shear, who used to visit Lebanon, go to Lebanon. Dorothy Shear, a former ambassador, American ambassador. And every time she went to Lebanon, bombs started exploding in Lebanon. And she's known for that. She's got that reputation. Dorothy Shear. Shay or Shea. So this lady, I resemble her to Dorothy Shear. 
Yeah, she ain't gonna help the Tate brothers. She's a waste of money, as well as their current lawyer. They ain't gonna uh, help you get out. Yeah, these are a bunch of controlled government assets. Yeah, including what's that other little winkle that comes on YouTube and slags down the Tate brothers? It's some Romanian little knob. Montana vlog, Montana vlog, yeah? This guy here, um, you need to investigate him. He is a government agent. He's here representing Romania. He's here representing the government. And he's here trying to clean up Romania's uh, status with its criminal activities that they openly carry out. And the only reason that that's been the case is because they're controlled by Israel, and we know Israel is a corrupt state. So I might get algorithmed up here. So um, watch him. Be careful of this Montana vlog. Yeah, he's an agent. He, he's he's receiving money from talking about Andrew Takes. That's the reason why he's doing it, and he's also receiving money from the local government in Romania. That's my point of view. It's your job out there, you journalists and investigative journalists, to debunk this. It's your job out there, to you, you journalists, to identify these Mossad agents that are running Romania and to start exposing it. And I ask Electric Intifada, Ali Abu Nimba, to get your fellow journalists. And I ask also... Mint Press, get your journalists on the Tate Brothers case and start exposing Israel for what they're doing to the Tate Brothers in Romania. Because this is how I see it. And one day, it won't be long before what I'm saying is going to be uh, factual and will be backed by evidence. So on that note, where are we now? Let me see if um, I can please some fans oh no the last race has just gone uh, uh, for Lebanese tips uh yeah the fact the tips have just finished on that all right okay so thank you for your time I hope people who get this messages forward it to Michel Sleiman the former president Said Hariri the former prime minister both of which I've received phone calls. I, I need accountability. I need accountability for my hunger strike. I was released after, shortly after the, uh, uh, I finally made contact with a friend of mine out in Italy who contacted my family here in London because I didn't have my phone. They took my phones. So I couldn't contact my family. I couldn't contact anyone. And I continued my hunger strike. And I was not going to stop my hunger strike until at least if I had contact. And I made contact with my dad eventually. Um, who couldn't, couldn't release me because they wouldn't allow him to release me. They refused it. They refused him using his powers to release me. And they presented me in an appeal whereby they gave me a trainee solicitor, let me just say that again, a trainee solicitor in an appeal, representing you in an appeal? What the heck is going on? But what I will tell you is, the lawyer that I was forced to appoint, yeah, one of their lawyers, um, had told me, and I quote, and I'm telling you this now, quote, Sam, I urge you to inform the public of your findings. Unquote. I said, what do you mean? What are we trying to say? Like, go on social media and tell them, Twitter, YouTube. She said, yes. So here's a lawyer who specialises with people who actually have a mental health problem telling me to inform the public of, of my findings about my presidential case. Are you listening, Ambassador Rami Mortada? Are you listening, Said Hariri, who you have obviously accepted allowing CID Met Police here in England to manipulate two of my sisters to tell them that I allegedly think that 
I think that Hariri is my friend. Bollocks. You guys need to wake up in Lebanon. Because if they're doing this to you, yeah, they, they've already done it to me. If they're doing this to you and you're willing to sit down and take it and bend over backwards for it and not do nothing, then what that just shows me, that demonstrates what kind of warlords you really truly are. Yeah, um, I have to be careful how I talk to you guys, but you'll have to forgive me. Yeah, I'm not trained to talk to you high-profile individuals, high-profile professionals, but I speak openly and I speak passionately and I'm trying to bring this to your attention and I'm seeking accountability on Met Police, how they treated me. I've already had consultant psychiatrists and psychiatrists see me and I've already had the final conclusion of, uh, uh, of it, which is nothing what the police have got on their documentation. The Ruthless Hospital in Huntercombe Hospital recently had two people uh, 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 were exposed on Sky News recently. And within the last two, two three months, three, um, three news uh, pieces of news on Huntercombe Hospital, the high category mental health hospital, the lowest standards quality in England, lowest standards of every watchdog possible on this hospital, on Huntercombe Hospital, were quoted. A nine-year-old girl has died in custody and is currently being investigated by Thames Police. She died in Huntercombe Hospital. I've been exposing this. And I told the police in Thames Police, I'm ready to be a witness as to what, how, 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 how they conduct themselves in Anticom Hospital. And I still open, openly uh, give myself as someone who's able to give you evidence on this. Now, I'm no longer using Blackford's lawyers because they won't appoint um, the doctor that I want, which is a uh, Section 12 consultant psychiatrist. Section 12 approved. His name is, well, he's a Lebanese geezer. He's known as the Wounded Healer. And I'm going to forward you a copy of my podcast, Mr. Wounded Healer, Healer yeah, who requested £200 an hour from um, my lawyer, Blackford, my former lawyers. And my lawyers were wanting to get me some dodgy £72 uh, lawyer, cheap lawyer. Now, I believe that the wounded healer, his name is Dr. Um, how many of you know a professional who could touch type? We touch type. Wounded healer. Yeah, he's been blown up by the British government. There we go. Wounded healer, Ahmed Hankir. Yeah, his Twitter account, Ahmed, A-H-M-E-D, H-A-N-K-I-R. I'm trying to get him to look into my case because I believe that he will understand my case better than your typical psychiatrist. Now, as I said, I've already had psychiatrists come and visit me, consultant psychiatrists come and sit down, three, four of them sit down in my house and apologise to me. Did you hear that? Apologise to me for the way they handled my case, for me being detained for no reason. And as till today, as until today, I'm not required to take any medication whatsoever. And I refuse to take any medication in Huntercombe Hospital. And there is a, a, a consultant psychiatrist there who got an 18-year-old girl to write my report. Do you hear that? 18-year-old girl who was running the whole of fucking Huntercombe Hospital to write my report. Now, is that legal? Of course it isn't. Yet the police have been guided by it. This malicious, malicious um, diagnosis of me. A new Lebanese government, yeah, 
you got a lot to learn. You really do. And I'm sorry if you might feel like you're humiliated or, 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 or intimidated by that, but you really are. Because when the ambassador of Lebanon, the, the, the number one representative of Lebanon here in England, Rami Mortada, refutes the higher ranking of a president, my respect to you goes down goes downhill, that you should refute a president who was acting as a president. Now, even Hazem Abdus Samad, former first council, even Hazem Abdus Samad, he said to me, Sam, was the president a president at the time this happened? I said, yes. It, now, this meant a lot to him. Yeah. And he made a promise to help me with my case and, and get me accountability so that I could rehabilitate myself back into the working environment. And he broke that promise. In the same way as Saeed Hariri made a promise saying to me via his former assistant, that lady that looks like, um, anyway, I'm not going to say what I think she looks like, but her name was Andrea, uh, Andrea, Oh, shit, I forgot her name. She was his PA. I'll remember it in my next podcast. But he got her to take the details off of me. And he contacted me six times, and he, including one phone call from, from Mustakbal head office. Bashir, his name was, who called me. Yeah. Said Hariri sent his journalists, his paparazzi, his journalists, to the coffee shop that I was in while I was tweeting to the Prime Minister, Said Hariri. Here in London, he sent his journalists who, were, who had big white zoom lens focused outside Old Street, focusing into Starbucks coffee shop. That's illegal in itself. You're not allowed to do that. It's a private property. He had journalists in the coffee shop that I was in who were focusing their fucking cameras on me. And I went up and confronted one of them. And before I can run outside to confront the one outside, he ran away, went down to Old Street Underground and ran away. But the one that was in the coffee shop that I was in, focusing his damn camera at me without asking me, in a, in a shop. I, I confronted him and I asked him, why are you doing that? Who sent you? Give me the name of the organisation who refused to do that. And I draw your attention to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check my Facebook, read my Facebook, read my timeline, read the pinned timeline and read, read it. You'll see information there. I probably won't be there for long. They'll probably ban me because I've outspoken. So what we've done, we've done an hour here, I think, 58 minutes. All right, we'll leave it for now like that. But it's important that this message gets out to the Lebanese community as well. I'll, I'll try to forward it now to some Lebanese um, Facebook groups. And, you know, I don't know why I am, because some of these Lebanese Facebook groups, yeah, they go around pretending they're Lebanese Facebook groups, but they are affiliated to government officials, Lebanese government officials. Or they are affiliated to the Lebanese embassy or the British Lebanese Association or are funded by them one way or another. I have people that work for them. I've sussed it out. So you Lebanese people, you need to learn, you need to learn what's going on here. You need to learn how the cookie is crumbling here with, with what was deemed by the Lebanese embassy, Ali Banout, as my case, as presidential case. Good evening. <laughs>